Hello, LKN friends and family. I'm honored to be here today uh, to launch an initiative that I feel is my best response to the health crisis that's happening right now with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm starting this, uh, what we're calling the LKN Healthline, uh, really to talk to my friends and family and community. I, I have 20 years of healthcare experience. I've worked in biotech, pharmaceuticals. I've been here in LA working as a provider in the surgical space. I've worked with Cedars. I've worked with Providence. I feel like the best thing I can do to help in addition to, you know, taking care of my family, taking care of my business partners, my employees, my family, my constituents is just put out the kind of information I want to see. And given my role and what are the roles I've played in healthcare, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fact-based. Fact I'm honored to be able to introduce my brand new LKN medical director. When it comes to giving out health information, I feel like the main people who should be editorializing the clinical issues is a doctor. Dr. Mahmood <laughs> is my it. personal physician. She's also a very dear friend of mine. She's an accomplice, board certified family practice, uh, medicine therapist, clinician. And here in Sherman Oaks and in Pasadena, we're going to team up. She's already seeing patients. She's already talking to her family, her friends, her patients. This is a perfect opportunity for us to start this. And this is going to grow, but we're going to start with us. And I'm dying to hear what you think about what's going on. Absolutely. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zainab Mahmood. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I am a board-certified family physician. And I am thrilled to be able to come in and um, contribute a little bit to what seems to be a lot of fear and confusion out there. Um, maybe we could help co clarify a few things for um, our audience. So coronavirus is um, a virus that belongs to a large family of um, viruses. Um, they're named corona because they under the microscope um, look a bit like a crown, um, which is the Latin derivative of the word. Coronavirus 19 was a, a new virus that caused an epidemic and eventually a pandemic, but the epidemic um, started in the city of Wuhan in China um, around the tail end of 2019, um, December. Um, it um, was a newly mutated virus, so the um, challenge for the healthcare industry was um, uh, to come up with a proper response. The um, viruses um, can live in humans as well as animals. Um, indeed, uh, COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus um, Disease um, 2019, um, is closely related to a, a coronavirus that's found in bats. Um, the um, spread um, in from the city of Wuhan and soon enough by January had extended to South Korea and then um, towards the end of February um, it hit Europe pretty hard and now in March um, we are um, starting to see the beginnings of it. How do you how do you characterize the you know the deadliness of the disease? How do we put this into a, a frame of mind from a clinician standpoint? I think that, of course, children, teenagers, older people, we're all worried that you're going to get very sick. You could potentially die. How do you? You know, there's comparisons to the flu. For me, when I want to have conversations with a loved one, I like to characterize how 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 can how will this kill you? Will this kill you, kill me? What is what is your what are your thoughts on that? So, can it kill you? Yes, that is a possibility. Fortunately, however, the rates that we have been seeing from China as well as other parts of the world um, have. Um, although the infection rates um, are actually highest in our age group, somewhere between 20 and 79 were, um, were the highest rates of infections, but um, we have found that I think what you're talking about is complications due to the infection. The complications um, tend to occur in our um, older, more senior patients um, 
who um, quite often have other medical problems um, that would complicate the management of their cases. The numbers we have received from China and Wuhan um, have um, indicated that the rate of death for the general population was actually 2.3%. However, these numbers jump to 8% for the age group between 70 to 79, and greater than 80, it's actually 15%. So the overall state of health the patient is in prior to the infection does um, predict um, uh, the course of the disease as well. I, I thank you for putting that into um, perspective. You know, again, if I if I have anyone who has a you know, let's say it's a walking pneumonia, let's say it's a bad flu. I've had pneumonia as a child. I, I know about Bernie Mac. I know about Jim Henson. You know, these are these are healthy young individuals who yes. just got to the ER t too late. Yes. To me, if I'm trying to characterize this as a non-clinician, and my thing would be, what what would be a trigger for you to to tell someone to go to a higher level of care? Be even beyond a patient calling you. What what are what are the first signs where we need to get to a professional to deal with this? So the, the general signs of uh, COVID-19 infection are um, primarily fever and um, shortness of breath and pneumonia. In 81% per, of cases, actually, according to the most recent data, again, that we have from China, which we were, is still developing, so, but the, the most recent data are saying that 81% of cases are actually mild. Um, and then, um, and in those cases, people would get flu-like symptoms, so fever, typically greater than 102, um, body aches and pains, they might have, they might have the sniffles, uh, a little bit of a sore throat. If there is a pneumonia case, it's usually very mild, think more of like a walking pneumonia. You're tired, you're having a fever, you're coughing a little bit, but you're still able to get out of bed if you have to. Um, the uh, severe cases, those comprise about 14% of cases, and in those cases, there is more of a clinical concern um, because um, patients will have trouble maintaining their oxygen levels mm -hmm. in the blood. There is more pronounced shortness of breath, and the pneumonia tends to be more severe, um, and those do require some more supportive care um, uh, rather than, or, or think of hospital admission as opposed to uh, someone kind of recovering at home, which the initial milder cases, they can recover at home without any issues at all. The critical cases, which are the ones that we worry about the most, these are the patients that could develop um, Respiratory distress symptoms need to be on a ventilator, um, and fortunately, um, these are about 5% or less than 5%, and typically think about, again, the elderly, more at-risk population. So if you characterize, you know, getting back to what, how are you describing mm -hmm. the, 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 the virus? Mm -hmm. So it's a virus. Correct. So a virus is difficult to deal with. If you have, you know, penicillin or, or an antibiotic, that's not going to work, correct. correct? So it's similar to the flu, right? Correct. Um, so if someone needs some kind of care, higher level of care, the, the compromising of the breathing, you, you said the O2 level, so you're saying they're going to need oxygen. Correct. They're going to be, ah, oh, what, what else would, would someone, what kind of treatment would someone get getting and going into a hospital or even ICU? So the, the, the main treatment for uh, COVID-19 is actually supportive treatment, which means that we do not have a medication that has been demonstrated to cure the infection or get rid of the infection. Our goal for treatment typically is to maintain the uh, healthy circulation, maintain enough oxygen in the blood, um, and then maintain the normal function of all the organs. To answer your question, I think anyone who thinks that they are high um, probability to catch the infection, meaning they 
recall coming in contact with a, uh, a person who is infected and has been demonstrated to be infected with coronavirus, those cases should present to care immediately. Um, I, my advice would be to contact your local Department of Health to request testing because presenting yourself with a possibility of COVID-19 infection um, without alerting your um, healthcare um, provider, whether that be an ER, your primary doctor, or a hospital, um, is not advised because you may be exposing other patients in those areas that are they may not have the same immunity to fight the infection. Oh, so that's a that's a great point. I, I I think that's an excellent point to pause there because so what you're saying is if you think you have the symptoms, you have fever, you have chills, you have a sniffle, whatever whatever the prevailing symptoms, how they're presenting, they're they're that type of a flu like symptom, not Correct. the stomach flu, but more of the respiratory type flu. Correct. So you're saying that we they should look up a resource where they can go get tested first by by the by the Department of Health. Correct. So so we will we will put information on that on our website. Correct. Cuz I'm sure most people are like well, that's not normal for them. Correct. Like and, and but that's actually safer. Yes. How, how long do you think it, if someone's worried and they they want to have a doctor see them right away how long is this testing going to take place like what what are the logistics of that i mean no you probably we all have limited experience okay yes but let's just you will we'll continue to evolve this we'll also add the resource if we don't answer this right now so what do you what, what how are you what if your son gets sick what would you do if my son gets sick i would immediately isolate him um, so I would put him in a room away from everyone at home um, if he has to be out of the room I would put a mask on him to prevent um, you know the droplets um, which are the main means of uh, transmission of the um, virus explain the droplets please okay so the um, the the transmission of the virus is still one of the issues that are being studied currently, actually. Um, the, the best um, theory we have is that this virus is spreading through droplets, which means that the infected person, uh, when they cough, sneeze, or sometimes even talk, um, shed the virus in the little droplets of saliva um, as they um, you know, go through these actions. The virus is um, th then may come in contact with other people if those um, people are with, within less than a two meter or six foot distance. But um, another issue that people really need to be mindful of is even if it lands on a solid surface or clothing, the virus may actually survive for anywhere between nine hours on clothing to 12 hours on solid mm. surfaces. So that brings us to our next point, which is disinfecting your immediate environment. But let's get back to your son. I didn't want to <laughs> pause there. Your son sounds like he needs help. So you... I would be cleaning the house as well to make sure Isolate that I him, start cleaning the disinfect house. Disinfect everything. How would you call the government to get the test? So I would, since we live in um, the Pasadena area, I would contact the Pasadena Department of Health and explain to them that I think I have a possible case of COVID-19. Obviously, we haven't traveled to any of the areas, um, but it, let's presume that we have. Um, and and that I would like testing. And typically what the Department of Health um, recommends is that you stay in place and then they will send um, properly geared, protected um, healthcare uh, um, workers to, to um, perform the test on you. They would the, come to your house. They would come to your house. They would come to you or direct you properly um, because I do hear that certain cities in um, around the nation have started drive-through testing. So as these um, uh, uh, facilities and um, other venues of testing become available, I'm sure they'll inform whoever calls. Okay. That, that's excellent. I think that covers that base. I think one thing we're going to work to do, again, we're going to just have a pragmatic step-by-step -step approach for both taking care of a patient, Correct. a family member, Correct. testing them, and, and assessing with Correct. the proper attention. Now talk about the dis, dis, disinfecting because we're both in the healthcare space. I, I, I accredit and, 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 and run and operate and, and, and have clients who own surgery centers and hospitals. We already know the yes. importance of hand washing and all of those things. Absolutely. And, and we're regulated to do that. But mm -hmm. So I see this as 
a great cleansing, a great cleansing uh, <laughs> from a clinical standpoint. So, but what's your take? Are we overdoing it, underdoing it? There's no such thing as underdoing disinfecting or cleaning, but the response is pretty vociferous <laughs> to say the least. I want to hear your thoughts. We're probably setting ourselves up for success, but in light of the fact now unemployment's at 20%, people or businesses are closing down. I think we need to start really assessing what Correct. we're doing and how quickly we need to do this to get back to normal. Correct. Um, so yes, this infection and social isolation are probably the only um, tools we have, unfortunately, right now to combat this very serious problem. Um, the So the disinfection, um, let's start with oneself first. So hand washing for 20 seconds, um, and this, this needs to be done every time you come in contact with um uh you know anything in the outside i would i actually recommend to my patients to you know the minutes especially if they have a high risk individual at home an elderly person or immunocompromised person to come in immediately without even greeting the their family members um take their clothes off throw them in the wash and take a shower themselves before so that whatever ended up on their clothing or on their body doesn't get transmitted to their loved ones at home so and then secondly is um hand sanitizer use which we love that in the healthcare industry um but the hand sanitizers that are effective against coronavirus should have a minimum of 60 percent if not 70 percent alcohol content um and and then of course mask wearing and the mask wearing is is Primarily so that you would not get the opportunity to touch your face because the again the droplets Need a way of getting transmitted into your mucous membranes, which is your mouth your nose your eyes mm, And so okay. we quite so it's often, not floating in the air. It's not floating okay. in the air. Correct. And so um, So the mask will help remind you not to touch your face um, Obviously if it's an ill person it definitely helps in um reducing the spread of the infection. But I also want to remind, you know, mothers out there, like remember your kids' play areas, remember your kids' toys, those are, those need to be disinfected as well. Um, uh, you know, bathrooms, um, uh, any surfaces that, you know, in your home that people tend to be in contact with a lot. I, I can think of my kitchen island being one, for example. These areas you need to pay extra special attention to when disinfecting. What about bedding and clothing? What are you, what's your take on that? Like, uh, I know a surface obviously could hold a droplet. And Correct. What about clothing, towels? So clothing, um, as I said, the, the best guesstimate we have right now is it can survive up to um, nine hours on textile fabric. Um, whatever it is and clothing being included so yes um, if you are say a healthcare um, worker or provider um, your clothes if especially if you are providing direct care to uh, coronavirus patients I, I would probably do my absolute best not to even get in the car change before I even leave my office or my hospital um, if possible, but e even if it's at home, take them off immediately, throw them into the washing machine immediately and start the cycle mm -hmm. before you even walk away because that's probably the safest way to handle it. So what you're saying is my wife, Lindsay, is correct. I'm not, <laughs> okay. I've been, I've been adhering to the rules. I have to disrobe outside. Okay. Um, luckily I have a back door so my okay. neighbors are not overly alarmed. Um, but. This has been excellent. I think we want to cover the basics. Yes. We want to have frank talk. Yes. I'm going to make a statement, and I would like Dr. Mahmoud to finish, but my statement is this. I'm not trying to politicize this. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to take advantage of this situation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a healthcare guy by trade, but I also have uh, businesses mm -hmm. in healthcare, and now uh, we started a business in, in agriculture in Montana, and, and I'm sure everyone is alarmed, everyone is concerned, everyone is afraid. I'll make one plug. I did release a statement on Friday for my Montana project. You can find it on Montana Farmer Development Group, how we're handling this. Our agronomist has already commented. This is less of a, a clinical concern than when we get into my health care and community issues. So I'm only here 
pulling the best of my best. We're going to start here. And that's where we're going we're gonna to keep going until the, and we're going to try to do this as, as uh, creatively as we possibly can. I would call on any friend and family in the clinical space if you want to get on board. She is not a paid medical director. I know she's probably looking at me like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> she's not. God bless you for helping me. Um, I, I'm going to say that. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in, war, I'm in war zone, war room. You know, I'm thinking of family and my, my friends and my community. I have, we have off, we have friends in all over the world. She's from the Sudan. I have an office in Manila, an office in India. Go. We're keeping a close eye, but we're ready to help. I can tell you that for sure. And we're going to start with information. Perfect. So I'm going to have, I'm going to start with the most you know, CDC, NIH, we're going to build our baseline of the best leading educational institutions yes. and, and government websites that are, have the best information right now today. That's that's the end of my statement. I want I will pass the conch to Dr. Mahmoud. Please close us out on this. I just have a few pointers. So it, I know you guys have been hearing about social isolation, stay away from everyone, quarantine yourself at home, disinfect and so on. But I um, I actually think it's extremely important to mind your state of mental health throughout all of this, how you're managing the stress of it all. I know there's a lot of information that is coming at um, all of us from different directions, but I think um, Kevin made a perfect suggestion. Follow what your public health officials are saying. Stay calm, disinfect, social isolate, and this will be something that humanity Ha, um, has survived just like many other plagues before. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Today is March 18th, 2020. I think stating the date along the way is going to be important because yes. this is going to change daily. That is and, correct. And we've set up a nimble little way to do this, so Absolutely. we're going to do our best as it comes, as we learn more and our community tells us more, we're going to make sure we tell you. So Absolutely. thank you very much for your time. Thank we you, We appreciate guys. it. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you.